Querida familia, precious family, good evening. I hope you're doing well. Thank you for joining us. Saints, allow me to share with you what I believe the Lord has put on my heart this evening. There are some verses in the Bible that are, to me, shocking. I read them, and I'm shocked by them. I'm like, wait, what? How does this even happen? Like, am I really reading this? One such verse, there's there's several, but here's one. One such verse is found in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Jesus speaking to the church at Laodicea, the lukewarm church. He says to them, chapter 3, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I cannot read that and not be shocked. I'll tell you why in just a few minutes. But the church at Laodicea, it was neither hot nor cold. And the Lord said to them, Because you are neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, that's not a compliment, obviously, right? However, did you know that when there is love involved, when somebody loves another person, Jesus here loves this church, he's going to rebuke them. Love is not love if it never rebukes and it never corrects. Love is love because love cares enough to correct. Parents, am I telling the truth? You love your children. You let them do whatever they want? No, of course not. You correct them. You discipline them. You direct them. You spend so much time developing them. Why? Because you love them. Because you love them. Jesus actually says this. Look, in verse 19, he says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent, as many as I love. He loves us, therefore, he corrects us. He loves us, therefore, he disciplines us. He chastens us. Oh my goodness, thank you, Jesus. For real, thank you, Jesus. You know what? If you're under correction of the Lord, you know what that means? You are legit his child because the Lord doesn't correct children that aren't his just like I never corrected children that weren't mine. They're not my kids. I'm at the mall and some kid's having a tantrum. You think I'm going to go and try to correct that child or try to talk to the parent? No, that's not my deal. Right? That's not my child. What business do I have trying to correct somebody else's child? Our Lord is the same way. Let's look at this statement of the Lord. He says, Behold. Now, I've told you before that this word behold is to stop and to be astonished by, to be overwhelmed with, to wonder, to be like amazed, like, wait, what? So anytime you read the word behold in the Bible, pay close attention to what is coming afterwards. Every verse in the Bible is very important, right? But when you see the word behold, it's like, perk up, pay attention, don't miss this because this is not to be taken lightly. This is to be pondered, to be meditated on, and to really think about. So this statement starts, behold, stop, be amazed at, wonder at this, be taken back by it even. It says, I stand at the door and knock. Are you getting the enormity of this? Jesus is not in the church. Jesus is now standing outside of the door of the church and he's knocking, trying to get into the church. Look at how amazing this is. Look at how bewildering it is that Jesus, I'm talking the one who died for the church, who purchased a bride for himself and bled on that cross for his bride, rose again ascended into heaven, and he is now gone to prepare a place for his bride. He loves his bride so much, and now he's standing on the outside knocking. That's shocking. Now notice something else. Jesus, this is one of seven letters that is written in the book of Revelation, each and every single one of them written to churches, to the pastors of the church, or to the church, you could say. Not written to governments. Not written to politicians, not written to lawmakers, not written to policy writers. When Jesus looks at the world, 
He looks at his bride. He looks at his bride. His attention and his affection is towards his bride in the world. That's why he writes to churches. He doesn't write to governments or presidents or kings or queens. He writes to pastors in these churches. These letters are written to churches. That's the door that he's knocking on. He's knocking on the door of the church. And look look at who it is who's knocking. It's not a vacuum salesman. You know, I'm back from the day. I've been around long enough. And maybe you remember these days. But I still remember the days where there was a milkman that delivered milk to your house. I remember those days. I remember the days where you had to put a stamp on an envelope if you're going to write to somebody because there was no email. I remember the days of calling collect. I also remember the days of the vacuum salesman. Okay? Kirby salesman or whatever. They would go door to door, knocking on doors in a neighborhood to sell their vacuum cleaner. This isn't the vacuum salesman in the neighborhood. This isn't Jehovah's Witnesses knocking at your door or the Mormons or some solicitor. This is Jesus. The King of Kings, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the great I Am. He is knocking at the door of the church. Now here's something else that completely blows me away. The way this is written is supposed to shock us. It is supposed to bewilder us and put us in a state of like, what in the world? For real. Here's something else. Amazing. Jesus, watch this. Jesus actually left the church. You know that he could have kicked the people out. He could have, he could have, it's his church. Mm -hmm. Jesus governs over his church. He could have kicked the people out and started with a whole new people because it's his church. Jesus is actually the one outside Mm -hmm. and he's knocking. Notice how gentle, compassionate, how kind, how loving our Lord is. He's knocking at the door. He's knocking. He's not breaking in. He's not ramming the door down. He's not doing that. But there's a knock. We got to ask ourselves the question, how long was Jesus gone? Did anybody notice him gone? Have you ever been into a church, walked into a church, not your church, you're just visiting someplace else, or maybe even your church, but you walk in there and you sense the Lord's not here. Ever happened to you guys? Mm -hmm. That's happened to me. Mm -hmm. I walk in. And all of a sudden, my spirit bears witness with his spirit. Because what people don't understand is that the meeting of the church together is spiritual before it is anything else. It's not about the worship team. It's not about the pastor. It's not even about the fellowship. But there's something spiritual that happens. And where the Lord is reigning in his church, he's enthroned and honored and glorified and praised in his church. You're going to know the Lord is in this place. Of course you're going to know it. I have walked into some churches and I know immediately the Lord's not in this place. How long has he been gone? I have no idea. How long was Jesus gone? I have no idea. Did anybody notice that he wasn't there anymore? Did not even one person, not even one, not even two people, not even somebody said, hey, you know something? Something's not right, man. The Spirit of God is not in this place anymore. The Spirit of Jesus is not moving in this place. Jesus is not glorified in this place. This has become about something else. Oh my goodness, the most beautiful, wonderful thing that the church can have is the presence of Jesus, period. I don't care how big the worship team is. I don't care how big the ministry is. The church can be 25,000 people big. It could be doing all kinds of good things in the community. If Jesus is not there, what's the sense? If Jesus isn't glorified, What's the sense? Exactly what happened to this church. For we read this. Look. Look at what we read. It says, because you say, this is how the church is looking at things. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing. Let me tell you something. This church is very successful. You would not know. Listen, apart from the Spirit of God and you having fellowship with Jesus... 
to the to the bare eye, you would not know that Jesus was not in that place. It's not it's not discerned physically. It's not discerned by the number of cars in the parking lot. It's not discerned by how many services they have or how many missionaries they have. It's not discerned that way. It is discerned spiritually because to the to the bare eye, everything looks great. This church is rich and wealthy. They have need of nothing. Do you understand? They have need of nothing. We're talking about a church that is very successful. And here's the point, right? Check this. Just because a church is successful doesn't mean that Jesus is in it. That's what we're reading here. The church is rich, wealthy, but Jesus is not a part of it. Question, do you want to be a part of a church that Jesus is not there? That Jesus is not a part of that church? I don't care how big the church is. I don't care how many ministries they have. It, that doesn't matter to me. If the Lord's not there, guess who's not going to be there? Me. I don't want to be there. I do not want to be there. But man, oh man, the pastor was so good. He, man, he was dynamic and he was powerful and he had a way with words. He was such an order and charismatic. And they were teaching verse by verse through the Bible. And this, the Lord left. Listen, the Lord left. What are you still doing there? I don't care how good the pastor is. I don't care how phenomenal the worship team is. Jesus is gone. What are you doing? Literally, what are you doing? I have walked into some churches, and I'm sure maybe you have as well, where you walk in and you're like, this is as dead as a doornail. This is a lot of religious activity. This is an amazing worship team, and they got a good order up there. And things look really, really good here. Every The place is nice and clean, but the Lord is not in this place. How does a church, how does a church get here? That's the question. How in the world does a church get here? Here's the answer. Indifference. The church at Laodicea became indifferent towards Jesus. They abandoned, watch, They abandoned fellowship with Jesus and started going after programs and they established committees. And now they have a big, nice board with a lot of wealthy people on it. And now instead of getting counsel from Jesus and fellowshipping with Jesus and being at his feet, now they're running to the board. Now they're running to intelligent people. Because now all of a sudden, the good shepherd, the one who died for the church, the one who bled for the church, the one who rose again for his church, now all of a sudden, he doesn't know how to guide his church anymore. So we better talk to very smart people. We better form committees. And Jesus says this, look at right, right after he says, I stand at the door and knock, he says again in verse 20, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. What is Jesus saying? I just want to have fellowship. How does Jesus get back into the door? Just fellowshipping with him, just being with Jesus. Listen, that's what it's all about. I don't care how much of the Bible you know if you don't know Jesus. You have to know Jesus. I know people that know the Bible, can study the Bible and teach the Bible better than me. They don't know Jesus. They're not walking with Jesus. They don't have fellowship with Jesus. They're just intelligent about biblical things. Saints, this is critical. I'm trying to tell you, listen, how did Jesus get outside the church? Because the people inside the church became indifferent towards Jesus. They became cold towards Jesus. They started becoming religious. Jesus didn't come to establish a Baptist church or Pentecostal Methodist or Lutheran. Okay, he's not into that. All this denominationalism, You won't find it in the Bible. Jesus wants to have fellowship with you and I, period. Ministry is born from that. Everything that you do is with Jesus. It's fellowshipping with Jesus. It's being at his feet. It's talking to him and walking with him and hearing from him and just being with Jesus. That's it. Oh, but, you know, the church gets too smart. And now all all of a sudden, Jesus is outside the door. Jesus is outside the door. So indifference towards Jesus, number one. Number two, an indifference towards sin. Listen to me close. How does Jesus get outside of the church? How is he now knocking at the church door? Indifference toward sin. I'm going to tell you this. Okay, I could talk a lot about this, but you don't hear too many sermons on sin anymore either. Now get this. 
I cannot tell you the number of people, probably in the hundreds, okay, 30 years of ministry, probably in the hundreds of people that had and have an indifference toward sin. Indifference toward sin. You hearing what I'm saying? Meaning this, look, pornography, adultery, living together. How many today Christians, they say they're Christians and they're shacked up together. They're living together. They're fornicating. And yet they go to church. They give. Maybe they're even in ministry in some church. And the guy can, man, he can rip rip that guitar, right? He can shred that guitar and he's on the worship team. Everybody thinks they're amazing. And nobody says anything about they're living together and they're living in sin, That's old school. I know that's old school. I'm old and I'm antiquated. And, you know, I don't actually think the Bible is literal. No, listen, that is called sin. That is called fornication and you're in sin. But in the church now, it's celebrated. Everything's cool. No worries. Pornography, the same thing. Gambling, all kinds of stuff that the church allows and even celebrates. And listen, I'm tired of hearing this because people say this all the time. Oh, I hate my sin. Oh, my goodness. Gambling? Oh, if I only told you all the money that I've lost in gambling. You're a believer. Wait, you're a believer and Christ died for you. He died to not only forgive you of your sin, but to free you of your sin. And you've been gambling for 35 years? And you don't have a penny saved up? And your wife divorced you? Your kids want nothing to do with you because you gamble everything away? Something's, hey, something's not right with that. But in the church, in the church today, sin is everywhere. Like this little leaven has leavened the whole lump and sin is celebrated and we're all inclusive and everything's fine, hunky-dory. Nobody talks about sin, especially not if that person in the church is wealthy. You better not say anything. That person's putting $20,000 every couple of months. He's putting $20,000, $30,000 in the offering plate. You better not say a word. He's paying our mortgage. You don't think Jesus sees that? You don't think an indifference towards sin grieves the heart of God? Jesus died for our sin. He bled for our sin so that we can be friends with it, so that we can condone it in other people and be okay with it. Come on, that's wrong. That is bad. You don't hate gambling. You love gambling. That's the real issue. You don't hate pornography. You love pornography. And because you love pornography, you make allowance for it. You entertain it. You can't wait to get back to it. The person says, oh, I hate gambling. Oh, I hate. You're not even speaking the truth. Because you know something? Let me tell you something that I really don't care for, that I don't like. I won't go as far as hate, but I have really absolutely no appetite for this at all whatsoever. Mushrooms. Hmm. Mushrooms. I, I don't care for mushrooms. You think I go to a restaurant and I order a bowl of mushrooms? No, why? Because I wouldn't say I hate them, but... I don't like them. Give me something with mushrooms. Guaranteed, you're going to have a little pile of mushrooms over here. I'm going to pick every single little mushroom out before I taste anything. I'm going to take every little. Why? Because let's say I hate them. I don't indulge in them. It doesn't even make sense. If you hate pornography, you wouldn't view it. It would disgust you. It would disgust you because it disgusts the heart of God and you don't want to transgress against Christ. You don't want to sin against Christ. Maybe you're ashamed of it. Maybe it's caused marital problems and women too. Women can be hooked on pornography. Maybe it's caused marital problems. Maybe you suffer some guilt afterwards. But the truth is you love your sin. Sin is pleasurable and you love it. And as long as you keep saying, oh, I hate my sin. I hate my sin. Nah. You're not going to get freedom from your sin that way until you call it what it is. It's sin. It's an offense towards God, and it needs to be repented of. And God has the power to give you to overcome that sin, whatever sin. Look, I'm just talking about gambling and pornography. There's alcoholism. There's all kinds of little secret sins, little pet sins that people entertain in private and in the dark. And you know what happens? The Lord is out because the Lord is not going to be in a house that is called a church, and all this stuff is going on. And now he's outside of the church. You know what Paul told the church at Corinth? They were participating at the Lord's communion table in an unworthy manner. He says some are sick and some have even died. And nobody nobody at the church at Corinth has said, Hey, wait a minute. Charles was healthy as a horse. 
But man, he was yucking it up. Last time we had communion, he was yucking it up and mocking the Lord's table, not giving it its importance. And man, wow, he just, he died. No, no, nobody put two and two together and say, wow, that guy died just like that. Like, like overnight, he's out. What happened there? Hmm? Nobody. Paul had to tell him, hey, here's the reason. Why? Because you have an indifference towards sin. Because you're not giving the communion table its proper worth. Indifference. Indifference towards Jesus. This is how the church got lukewarm. This is how Jesus got outside the church. That's what we're talking about. There was an indifference towards Jesus. It all starts with Jesus. An indifference towards Jesus. When a person has an indifference towards Jesus, guess what? They'll have an indifference towards sin. And here's the last one I'm going to share with you. When people have an indifference towards Jesus, people, I'm talking Christians in a church, they have an indifference towards Jesus. Jesus is not honored. He's not praised. He's not glorified. Now they will have an indifference towards sin. And when they have an indifference towards sin, they will have an indifference toward one another. Take it to the bank. Those three things. That's how the Lord got outside of his church. That's how the Lord is now knocking. He's so gentle. There's nobody like Jesus. So humble. There's no one like, so humble. He knocks. And he says, hey, I rebuke you because you have an indifference towards me. You have an indifference towards sin. You guys think that you have arrived. And now you have an indifference towards one another. That's the deal, people. Listen, indifference towards one another. I don't care what you're going through. What are you bothering me with your problem for? I'm here because this church has a really great NFL party. And I'm part of the you know boys group here. Or my kids are part of the children's ministry here. Don't give me your problems. I have my own problems indifference towards one another they don't they don't share in each other's hurt they don't share in each other's joy it's just it's like punching a card a religious card say i've done my religious duty and now i'm out of here i did what i came here to do and now i'm out oh my goodness you don't think that jesus wait jesus died for your brothers and sisters and you don't have the moment to say hey how are you doing is everything okay how can i pray for you embrace them and live your life outside of yourself and do something wonderful for somebody else, another child of God, your brother or sister made in the image of Christ, when you start having indifference towards Jesus, it's a snowball effect. You'll have an indifference towards sin and then an indifference towards one another. And that, my dear friends, is why the church is in the state that it's in today. Look no further. It abandoned Jesus a long time ago for intelligent programs on church growth, dynamic pastors that can speak really well, and also amazing worship teams, nice big buildings that are nice and clean. It's like Disney World here. Just come and everything's amazing. We're here to entertain you, razzle dazzle you. And you know, the pastor's got great stories. He's got more stories in the public library. And oh, and he's funny and he's so good. But Jesus isn't there. That's how the church gets lukewarm. It gets very successful. And then it becomes indifferent towards Jesus, indifferent towards sin, all kinds of things. Listen, it's like I told you on Saturday, all kinds of things are happening in the church. And with the pastors, with the pastors, it grieves my heart. I'm almost embarrassed to call myself a pastor. Or when people ask me what I do for a living, it's embarrassing because I get that look like, ah, you're one of them guys, a charlatan that's after money, probably into adultery. What, what other else are you hiding back there? And yeah, it's all going to come out. That's how people look at the precious office of a pastor. Can you imagine? And look at, and for the most part, they're right. How many men that we thought were walking with the Lord, were evangelists around the whole world, who were world-renowned apologists and have fallen? Guys who had mega churches, were successful, written all these books, and all of a sudden you find out they're involved in some secret sin, adultery, embezzling money, all kinds of stuff. It grieves the heart of God. Now, let me bring it home. The Lord, he says, behold, I stand at your door and knock. It's not a church now. Now we are all members of the body, of, so we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, meaning that the Lord knocks on the door of my heart and says, hey Johnny, can I come in? I just want a fellowship with you. I want to break bread with you. 
I want you to be with me. I, I just want to be with you. The creator of heaven and earth wants to be with me and wants to fellowship with me, wants to hear from me, wants to love on me. What are you going to do? Are you going to continue to have an indifference towards the Lord, towards your sin, towards other people? Or are you going to let the Lord in? It all begins with the Lord. Like I said, you know something? You can't fellowship with the Lord on a daily basis and commune with him and be with him and still be that attracted to your sin. Not going to happen. That sin issue is going to be gone. That thing that you've been enslaved to, trust me, out of here. Why? Because all of a sudden you love Jesus more than you did that sin, whatever that sin may be. And then, ooh, you're going to love other people, period. And not just believers. You're going to love everybody across the board. Why? Because you're fellowshipping with Jesus. You cannot have Jesus filling you every day to overflowing and you not love other people. Not going to happen. Impossible. Question. The Lord is knocking. Will you let him in? Are you going to let him in? Are you going to let him in today? I sure do hope so. You say, oh, Johnny, I'm already a Christian. I'm not talking about being a Christian, not being a Christian. This is a church. They were all Christians, but they weren't fellowshipping with Jesus. That's the issue. I'm talking about fellowshipping with Jesus. I'm not talking about salvation. Let him in so that he can fellowship. Dine with you, sup with you, and you with him. May the Lord richly bless you. Lord willing, see you Saturday.